There's a place of unimaginable beauty, of colours that literally seem like they're out of this world. A place of untold cultural and spiritual significance. A place treasured here and around the world. And imagine that place was disappearing right in front of our eyes. It'd be hard not to wonder just how did we get here? For too long, we've thought it's the Great Barrier Reef, the largest living structure on the planet. It's indestructible. What well, we've found over the years is that it's not indestructible. In fact, we're bringing it to its knees. In the last 30 years, we have lost some 50% of our, our coral cover. The elephant in the room is climate change. Fundamentally, Australia has a conflict of interest between stewardship of the Great Barrier Reef and the income from exporting fossil fuels. This is coal. Don't be afraid. The Don't be scared. I hang my head in shame and embarrassment at the absolute lack of vision of the people in this place. Sometimes I wonder if the Greens think bloody energy comes from unicorn farts. There are challenges on the Great Barrier Reef. There always have been. There has been mistakes made, but I'm sure there's going to be measures put in place that these won't happen again. It is like a monster. It just slowly seeps in and it takes over the community. Then they're just worried about the profits they're going to take out of the community. As descendants of our ancestors, we have to stand up and we have to fight to stop these practices of mining in our country. Coal is good. They're allowing ports to get away with murder. Like lending your sports car to the teenager next door. For the past four years, scientist Alan Dobrovolsky has been testing the waters of the Great Barrier Reef. Concerned with the degradation in water quality, his research has led him to believe that the reef is facing an environmental disaster of enormous proportions. My first experience with an environmental disaster was at Chernobyl, when I was studying the distribution of radionuclides in the environment. The scientists at the reactor were trying to push the reactor to find its capabilities. With the Great Barrier Reef, I see a large-scale environmental disaster and some parallel story in a way that uh, we're all trying to find the breaking point, and I guess it is very close. The reef needs protection. As Alan travels the coast of the Great Barrier Reef, he talks with residents, scientists, community activists and politicians about the hotly debated state of the reef. I'm hoping to find out whether there is a chance for us to cooperate. Because what I can see so far is it's a lack of cooperation from different uh, groups of the society. There are so many different communities dotted along the Queensland coast. From Cape York at the top, to Gladstone, 2,000 kilometres away at the southern end of the reef. These communities are as diverse as the marine ecosystem beyond their shores, with each having an impact of some kind on the reef. In economic terms, the reef currently employs 64,000 Australians and adds over $6 billion a year to Australia's GDP. If we do not manage the reef better and find the balance between the economy and the environment, will reach a breaking point. A further 2,000 kilometres south lies Canberra, the nation's capital, and home to the Australian government. While the reef dies, many politicians here choose to argue over what or who is to blame. Uh, there are challenges on the Great Barrier Reef. There always have been. Always have been. Uh, but uh, uh, that is well recognised uh, uh, by the um, uh, government. The Greens political party have seemed to have uh, undertaken a campaign to denigrate the Barrier Reef so that uh, one of the great sources of uh, revenue, of expert uh, earning dollars and jobs in Queensland, which comes from the reef, is uh, decimated. That seems to be the Greens' political campaign because most of the rhetoric that uh, they go on with about the health of the reef is simply just not true. 
can I assure the Chamber that in the uh, six mm. years that I've been discussing the health of the reef with relevant coral reef scientists, with the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority, with the Institute for Marine Science, they are speaking with one voice in saying that the reef is under serious threat and that the biggest threat to the reef is human-induced global warming and begging for this government and the opposition to change policies so that we can save what's left of the reef. Just a few kilometres from Senator Ian McDonald's office in Townsville is James Cook University. Some of the world's premier scientists work from this campus, including the world's leading coral reef scientist, Professor Terry Hughes. The Commonwealth Government itself produces uh, five yearly reports, they're called a Great Barrier Reef Outlook reports, that document um, a gradual decline in the health of the Great Barrier Reef. So we used to think that the Great Barrier Reef would continue its slow decline in coming decades if we didn't improve management. But we were actually wrong because the Great Barrier Reef is now in the worst condition that we've ever recorded in 30 years or more of monitoring. And that's because half of the corals in shallow water has died in the last two years. Um, Mr. Um, Acting Deputy President, uh, the Barrier Reef is going fine. I encourage anyone to visit the Barrier Reef. It is an experience uh, worth having. It's an experience that will be there forever. And I urge people to uh, take advantage of it. Tourism around the reef began nearly 100 years ago, and this sustainable industry could go on forever if the reef doesn't die. Sunshine, chase those clouds away. I know you're gonna brighten up the day with love. When you shine up above. Many of the once thriving tourist hotspots dotted along the reef have in recent years evolved into major industrial ports. Beams guide me on my way Let your subtle glow be all I need to know That I'm in love We're in love Determined to get to the bottom of why the reef is dying, Alan heads to Gladstone, a once bustling fishing and holiday town, now the fourth largest coal port in the world. More recently, Gladstone developed its port even more, so the town could begin to export large quantities of LNG, liquefied natural gas. In order for LNG vessels to travel into the Gladstone port, dredging exercises were conducted. These disturbed the seafloor, stirring up mud and heavy metals. These dredge plumes can be detected on satellite images up to 30 kilometres away from the original site. Gladstone is an export town. We export uh, a lot of grain, aluminium and, of course, a lot of coal. You know, we had, have had uh, big developments in our harbour because uh, the three gas plants have been uh, on Curtis Island, which is about four kilometres offshore. And to get the gas onto ships, we've had to do a certain amount of dredging in our harbour. And uh, that has caused a few concerns to our port. Yes, in Gladstone, the uh, conditions of what they did, the monitoring and that looked okay, but in fact, they were done very poorly. And as you know, they missed six months of a bun wall leaking and contaminated sediment into the harbour. Dr John Brody is a former director for water quality and coastal development for the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority. Over his 30-year career, he's worked for both government and as a consultant to industry and is one of the world's leading voices in water quality management. Of course, it has the problem of being, for all the ports, the same, that Queensland Government's the owner of the port, Queensland Government's the regulator. And unless you have some independent body out there overseeing that, that's never going to work. Now, there were issues with the construction of the uh, bun wall. The uh, seismic matting was put in the wrong place, by error of judgment by... Uh, a few departments, that has since been corrected and the wall of that uh, reclaimed land has stopped uh, uh, leaching into the harbour 
and uh, but there took a lot of work and that could have been avoided with a bit better planning in the first stage. It wasn't planned correctly, it wasn't uh, built correctly and it wasn't, the wall wasn't constructed properly. Environmental disaster, that's Gladstone in uh, as short a phrase as you can get. And unfortunately, according to the government and the Port Authority, prior to the dredging, they dotted their I's, they crossed their T's, they did all the environmental impact statements, they put in all the conditions necessary to protect Gladstone Harbor, and it turned into an absolute fiasco. I rise today to speak on a matter of vital importance, not only to central Queensland, but to the whole of Australia. A major public health scare has emerged in Gladstone. To date, two fishermen have been hospitalised, numerous deaths of turtles have been recorded, uh, all, um, also uh, Barabundi and other marine life. While it's not confirmed, our marine deaths could be a case of red spot disease caused by acid water. If this is correct, a new approach to disturbing the harbour floor must be found. Acid sulphide sediment must not be disturbed. Whatever the problem, it needs a complete, independent, thorough and honest investigation. Fleet port developments have environmental impact assessment processes. The problem at the moment is that they're done by consultants. If those consultants don't get the right answer, they don't get any more work. And in the end, it leads to the outcome that the developer wants, not the best outcome for the Great Barrier Reef or the environment or anything, just the best outcome for the developer. The cause of the death is still in some dispute. Some of the toxic metals in the sediment were above uh, guidelines, Australian guidelines, quite a few actually. The other thing to remember at Gladstone is that there was an awful lot of work done which has never been released properly, never been written up properly, never been peer reviewed properly. And so it's a very messy situation in the sense of actually finding out where all the data is and what it really means. I'm first to admit there has been mistakes made, but uh, they have been corrected. Let's hope, I don't, let's, say, let, don't, let's hope, I'm sure there's going to be measures put in place by our environmental people that these won't happen again. The companies came into down in town and made a lot of promises about their financial requirements to the town, what they believe their social responsibilities to the town were. And it's true, they did help with arts and they did help with um, some of the council funding with sports and other things like that. But the reality is, is now that they've gone to this stage where they no longer need no more approvals, they don't require the consent of the government or the community to do what they're going to do because now they are unstoppable. They are now at this stage where there will be no ceasing. They've now withdrawn all of this funding and they've withdrawn all this money that was in the community. So it was a fraud. It was a fraud. Bob Macosta is a local development contractor and has been providing services to the mining industry for over 20 years. More recently, he's been operating a turtle rehabilitation facility set up with the assistance of Australian Pacific LNG. People like to try and pick an easy target, which in Gladstone was a dredge. I have no issues blaming the dredges for what they've done if they've done something wrong, but we should not target them purely because there's a financial base backing them. The single biggest issue that I can see was the massive rain event that was in Christmas 2010, early 2011. That's what prompted us to start the rehab centre. As far as the dredging, I mean, we've, we've had a rehab centre operable when the bulk of the dredging actually occurred. And like anecdotally, we have seen no issue in any of the turtles that we have um, rehabilitated here. Whilst Bob hasn't seen any negative impacts from dredging on the turtles, John Brodie tells a different story. His research states that it is likely that the elevated metals found in the stranded turtles resulted from metals mobilised through the dredging and leakage of the bunded area into which the dredge spoil was placed. The degradation in water quality is one of the major threats facing the reef. Gladstone's industrial expansion may have caused damage to a once pristine environment. We're talking about the Great Barrier Reef here, and you don't mess with the Great Barrier Reef. 
You don't take any chances with the Great Barrier Reef. You don't say, well, the coal industry takes precedence and we'll get all we can out of it while the going is good. And when the boom is over, then we can take a more measured approach and start taking better care of the reef. There is only one Great Barrier Reef. And if we destroy all that makes it special and unique, there won't be a second chance. It doesn't matter how much money we make out of our mining exports, we won't be able to buy a new one. Diving deeper into his investigation, Alan meets with Dr Liam Wagner, an energy economist who tells him about the economic impacts of the development. I honestly think that Gladstone will be an enormous failure economically for Australia. The coal seam gas sector in Queensland was touted as being the next great thing and we were going to be the largest exporter of LNG um, and bigger than Qatar. I think that there was a vast overestimation of the resources available, a overestimation of the technological capability of oil and gas companies to extract that coal seam gas and there was a underestimate of uh, the costs associated with it. This development has come with many growing pains and a great deal of debate over the impact on the local environment. There's a lot of further uh, future development to be done in Gladstone. It's my belief that uh, the Gladstone port should be uh, developed to its fullest extent before anyone looks at developing other coal export terminals up and down the coast of Queensland. In addition to LNG, Queensland also contains vast amounts of coal and many companies are seeking leases to build mines in the area. All of which require government approval. Another port on the shores of the reef, Abbott Point, would need to be expanded if these mines were approved. It would have the capacity to export 120 million tonnes of coal per year, making it the largest coal port in the world. Bowen is the nearest town to Abbott Point, so Alan heads there to search for more clues about the demise of the Great Barrier Reef. Locals are divided about the future development of the port, as it will increase the amount of dredging and ship activity, but could potentially be a lifeline to a community in economic decline. Mining activity and port expansion in the Bowen area has long been a cause for division, debate and confusion. Okay, Paula, thank you for meeting our team in this beautiful town. And we would like to ask a couple of questions with regard to what is your view on dredging generally and how do you think it may affect uh, industry you are in? Yeah, certainly, Alan. Look, um, as I said, I'm not a, don't claim to be any expert, but um, to us, it's, it's all about the truth. And um, all the facts about coral reef um, damage isn't from dredging. Um, you know, again, I just want the people to stick to the facts. The facts are that the, you know, the damage to the reef is caused by um, storms and cyclones. It's caused by the, um, the crown starfish and it's caused from bleaching. Now, if we shut down the community, we, you know, we might still have the environment, but we won't have any accommodation left. We won't have any restaurants left. We won't have any service industries left. So there'll be nothing for people to come and look at or stay at anyway. Uh, the unfortunate thing that I guess us locals get cranky about is that you know, this is our community. Other people from Melbourne and Sydney can come and dictate to us about how our community looks and acts and um, you know they must think we're fools if we think we're going to ruin this beautiful environment we've got. We want to protect as much as anyone. And sometimes I wonder if the Greens think bloody energy comes from unicorn farts. So the Australian Marine Conservation Society has existed for more than 50 years. We were actually founded to save the reef and people are desperately concerned about the state of the reef and so we offer them various ways to express that concern, particularly to politicians or the media. So as you all know, we're here today because there is a new wave of threats including cyclones, storms, uh, climate change, there's a whole host of pressures impacting on the Great Barrier Reef but we're now concerned with the plans to dredge 100 million tonnes of seabed in our World Heritage Area. And I'm sure in 50 years time again we'll look back and say what were we thinking? Just like we look back now and think how could they even imagine drilling the reef for oil? Back in the 60s 
you know, there was a, a proposal to mine coral limestone and to use it as fertiliser on a cane farm. And shortly after, the Bajoka Peterson government leased a whole lot of uh, oil uh, leases throughout the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, and of course, that resulted in a massive national campaign against oil drilling on our Great Barrier Reef. Uh, and of course, that was a successful campaign, a huge mobilisation, which we were a key part of. Um, and that led to the declaration of the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park in 1975. This landmark decision was followed in 1981 by the World Heritage Listing of the Great Barrier Reef. Since then, subsequent governments have tried to strike a balance between the economic and environmental benefits of this natural wonder, expanding protections of the marine park while also exploiting the area for tourism, fishing, shipping and natural resources. While people have been living along the reef for thousands of years, industrialisation in recent decades has begun to threaten its health. In the 60s and 70s, it was limestone and oil mining, while in the 80s, a rise in tourism meant increased activity on the reef. By the 90s, agricultural runoff was taking its toll. Commercial fishing was depleting marine populations and larger outbreaks of crown of thorns starfish were occurring. From 2000 onwards, even though the marine park has been rezoned to its largest ever levels, new coastal developments, port expansions, an Australian resources boom in full swing, and an ongoing degradation in water quality meant that the health of the reef and its world heritage status were under threat like never before. By 2012, the UNESCO World Heritage Committee was considering listing the reef as in danger. If the Great Barrier Reef was to survive, it needed serious attention from the highest levels of government. This week, the World Heritage Committee is meeting to discuss UNESCO's draft decision about the state of our Great Barrier Reef. The draft decision says the reef is on track for World Heritage Just, just wait a minute, Senator Waters. You are entitled to be heard in silence. There is talk going on on both sides of the chamber. It makes it While 70,000 jobs depend Order. on a healthy Great Barrier Reef, some in government seem not to take the issue seriously. The draft decision said that the reef is on track for World Heritage in danger listing within eight months if current developments proceed. It said there should be no new ports, no port expansions that would harm the values of the reef, no new development approvals before the strategic assessment of the reef is finished, and that independent science is needed into the Gladstone Harbour. Excuse me, Mr President, this is ridiculous. Order. 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 Continue. Order. On my left. Order. Order. <sighs> Senator Waters. Thank you, Mr President. I'm so pleased the Chamber is so excited about the Great Barrier Reef. It's wonderful. Order. Order. Professor Terry Hughes often urges government to respond to the declining health of the reef. Alan asks him what he thinks is behind this dismissive attitude of some members of parliament. I think fundamentally Australia has a conflict of interest uh, between, on one hand, its responsibilities under the World Heritage Treaty for stewardship of the Great Barrier Reef, the world's largest coral reef ecosystem that's truly iconic, and on the other hand, the income from royalties for exporting fossil fuels. I mean, the Great Barrier Reef is in, intensively managed and it has been for uh, many years. And the level of protection has gone up and up. But in Australia and elsewhere around the world, we tend to deal with the symptoms rather than dealing with the root causes. The elephant in the room is climate change. Uh, why didn't the Prime Minister agree with her former climate change minister, Senator Wong, that a carbon tax uh, will see Australian jobs transfer overseas? In Australian politics, jobs and growth are often used as arguments against any reform to the mining and energy sectors. Well, I say to the Leader of the Opposition, get to, to grips question. with the fundamental of this debate. And the fundamentals of this debate are climate change is real. It's caused by human activity. We need to reduce carbon pollution. 
The best way of doing that is to price carbon. A price on carbon would have paved the way for big environmental change. And in 2011, the Australian government had a left-wing majority. But the right were relentless in their attack of a tax on carbon emissions. I rule out a carbon tax. How can she justify Order, the today's betrayal? Well Move those How can posters. she justify? The Leader of the Opposition will resume his place. Now is the time for him to put aside the brutal politics he has played with climate change, put away his uh, propensity for political destruction and actually work with the rest of the parliament to do the right thing by this country. After five years of debate, in 2011, Julia Gillard managed to legislate a price on carbon emissions. But her opposition continued to attack the new legislation. Do not come into this house and pretend that this is about controlling electricity prices. The intent, the scope, the meaning, the purpose of everything you are doing is to drive up electricity prices precisely so as people all around Australia will decrease the amount of electricity they use in order to cool themselves in summer or decrease the amount of electricity they use in order to heat themselves in the depths of winter. In 2013, just two years after the Clean Energy Bill was passed, there was a federal election. While the new legislation had reduced emissions and set a global benchmark to combat climate change, the opposition campaigned on rising energy costs and the impact of the policy on business. The opposition won. I call the Honourable Member for the Environment, Minister for the Environment. The purpose, the intention, the construct of the carbon tax is to increase the cost of living, most specifically the price of electricity and gas for Australian families. The bills honour the Coalition's commitment to the Australian people to scrap this tax. The emissions trading scheme is dismantled in the lead up to UNESCO's decision on whether the Great Barrier Reef will be listed as in danger. Alan travels to Bonn to hear what the Australian government will say. Looking around is very inspiring to see such a diverse and dedicated group of UNESCO um, community members here this evening at the bottom. You've traveled from all corners of the globe because you share a common commitment to world heritage. Many of our most precious natural and cultural treasures are at risk, and working together to protect them is, of course, one of the main reasons we've come together here in Bonn. While there, he meets John Day, a former director of the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority. I started with them in 1986. Mm -hmm. I also spent seven years from uh, about 1990 to 97 working for the state agency, the Queensland Parks and Wildlife Service. So I worked on both the state and the federal side of managing the Great Barrier Reef. I think my role is one of making sure that the uh, wider public are aware of the real concerns. The science itself is showing that the, the, the reef is under pressure and the government's own reports say this as well. So the scientific evidence for something like corals is showing that there's a lot of different pressures building up on the Great Barrier Reef. The conservation issues related to the Great Barrier Reef for heritage property, the ultimate measure of success will be a scientifically sound confirmation that the current documented declines in the property have halted and are reversing. And this is what the committee will consider, whether it should be listed in danger. I want to stress though, in danger isn't going to fix the problem. What needs to happen is action, and that action is going to require resourcing. And this is where the Australian and the Queensland governments have to both uh, meet those, those challenges and do more than they're currently doing. Uh, After having fiercely opposed Australia's position on climate change, Alan sees Environment Minister Greg Hunt defend the management of the reef. Now I would like to give the floor to Australia. We have clearly heard the concerns of the World Heritage Committee. And I can tell you, Australia and Queensland have responded. In fact, the committees, and in particular Germany's interest and advice on the reef, 
For this, I thank you. We have permanently banned the disposal of capital dredge material in the marine park and entire World Heritage Area. The Australian government has announced recently a ban on the dumping of capital dredge spoil. And that's, that's a good uh, move forward. What the Australian government has failed to say loudly, but it's written there in small print, is they will continue to dump what they call maintenance dredge spoil in the sea. Now this is about one million cubic metres of dredge spoil every year. Madam Chair, Queenslanders, Australians love the Great Barrier Reef. They love it so much, they elected a government committed to protect it. And that's exactly what we will do. Thank you, Australia. So, I declare decision 39.7B.7, adopted. UNESCO decides not to list the reef as in danger, but instead gives Australia five years to show it can improve the health of the world's largest living structure. But only a few months later, Greg Hunt approves the Abbott Point coal port expansion. The only catch is that the Indian mining company Adani, which has the lease on the port, must prove that their nearby Carmichael coal mine project can be funded in order for the expansion to go ahead. The proposed mine would be one of the largest in the world. For a mine like that, if it was worth building, it should have been economic and they should have built it. But it's not. It's not economic from a coal mining perspective. It's not, none of the, um, none of the banks want to, to fund it. So it's not bankable. None of the insurance companies want to insure it. So it has a high um, perceived risk associated with mining that resource. And again, the environmental impacts are just disturbingly catastrophic. Despite the mine's unfavourable economic position, the Australian government continues to fight for its development. Let's take the Carmichael mine in central Queensland. Member for this Chifley. is a $20 billion investment. At one point, it even offers a $1 billion taxpayer-funded loan to help it get off the ground. Does the Labor Party care about the workers of Australia? Oh. Nothing illustrates it better than what's happening in relation to the Adani Carmichael mine. I tell you what, I tell you what, we are going to stand up for this investment. Have you realised it's not a good look to go to the Paris climate talks? admitting you approved a single coal mine that alone will generate more pollution than the entire European Union does in one year. This mine is being legally sabotaged by green activists running a strategic campaign against the coal industry and in fact against all large developments. In relating to the climate destroying and job killing Adani coal mine. I just want to take issue at first uh, with your description of it being climate destroying and job killing. A coal mine will generate thousands of jobs in North Queensland. Adani are not new to Australia. They are a company that has operated here now for six years. They have operated the Abbott Point coal terminal just near Bowen in Queensland. Multinational oil companies are the modern day colonialists. It's a coordinated effort not only by one company sort of standing on its own, they all have a mutual interest to change the regulatory framework and governance frameworks of countries that have resources they want to exploit. And they do it well. Order. What we've got is an opposition that has sold out lock, stock and barrel to some sections of the mining industry because it's more focused on a return to its own pockets Order. in the form of donations Order. The than a complex debate. This question is about jobs and protecting the environment, and that's what we do on this side, unlike those on the other side who only want the votes from the Greens. The minister will so the two previous energy ministers in the federal government of Australia are now working for the mining industry. Martin Ferguson and Ian McFarlane from the Labor Party and the Liberal Party are both working 
to promote the industry that they had previously regulated. Because when one understands how the machinery of government for a particular department works, you're the best person to lobby it and to change it from the outside. Allen ventures inland to an area that will be most affected by the Carmichael mine developments. He meets the traditional owners of the land that has been converted by mining ventures for its water supply. The river people of the Biri Guppa Aboriginal tribe know the land and its history well. Uncle Kenny's grandfather was born on the Bowen River. Okay, here we are standing on one of the heart of the Biri country, Biri people. From the ranges back out to the Mount Coolan, the Baliando rivers there, is where our land stops with the Janga, the neighbouring clan, the Yulba and the Wiri people up this way. So we're right in the heart of our country here. This mine here was set up about seven years ago. They started exploration and it's only been seven to eight years now in production. And the Strider is one of the big companies here. A lot of the coal is open cut here. It is washed here in the wash plant that you see behind us. And on this railway line here, this is the railway line which takes us straight to Abbott Point and straight overseas from here. So this is one of their main infrastructure corridors that they have in place. Why do the Australian people keep giving their power away to people who are disrespectful and got no wisdom? It's like lending your sports car to the teenager next door. Uncle Kenny continues the tour of his country, heading to an area that for the last five decades has avoided development. Water is another natural resource that's required for large-scale mining. The system here where we're standing is the, the mouth of the Urana Creek and the Broken River catchment from the Yungala hinterlands. And this is the crossing of Urana, which was established many years ago, but down at the big lagoon where we came through is the Urana Dam wall proposal down there, which they want to put from Mount Corley to Mount Dingo, I think it is. And that's where the water will be blocked there. And it'll inundate this area all through the valley here for about 53 kilometers. And they said it will take over seven years to fill the capacity of what they need, but it's a bigger valley than any other catchment in the area for water storage. The Urana Dam project is once again being considered. This will be the 18th study in the area for the dam since 1960. None to date have recommended a dam would benefit the area economically. This 40 year that they're trying to captivate will be sent out to Carmichael mine through a gravity fed pipeline where they don't have to use pumps or anything like that and they'll gravity feed the water out through the Galilee and then out through the agricultural triangle of North Queensland. So yeah, it's a big project that they're looking to do in this area. If we're not seen to negotiate or act in the best endeavours of the goodwill negotiations, the land will be acquired through the, the land acquisition, where they will actually acquire the land with or without us, you know, so we need to take another approach to how we're going to, you know, approach this negotiation with companies, and we don't want the dam here at all, at all. To us, it's not a very good process that they're walking down, and we can see that they're just trying to brush through this process with representatives who are willing to approve such a project in this area and not looking at the cultural or the environmental value of this land. And a lot of the people who are negotiating has never even been to this country. So everybody, I want you just to sit and close your eyes and listen to the ancient time, the dream time. The connection between our people and the river is life. That's our creation, that's everything. This is an ancient teaching that has been passed down. And that's through our law, our marriage systems, our trading systems, through our rivers, through our mountains and our stories of places. And that still exists today. 
the significance of the river. The river runs all the way to the ocean, so our connection is right through the river system. And now that mining is a big part of our country up here now, more so than agriculture, well, the demand for water out of our country is, you know, very in high demand by these mining companies who do have independent pipelines and infrastructure where they feed their own mines. We don't believe that it, our country should be used because it won't sustain that type of development. It's not sustainable for our natural resources or our water in this country. As descendants of our ancestors today, you know, we have to stand up and we have to fight for that sacredness of our rivers and try to stop you know, these practices of mining in our country. This is coal. Don't be afraid. The Don't be scared. Won't the treasurer you. knows the rule on crops. It's coal. Mr Speaker, those opposite have an ideological, pathological fear of coal. There's no word for coalophobia officially, Mr Speaker, but that's the malady that afflicts those opposite. But it's that malady, Mr Speaker, that is afflicting the jobs in the towns and the industries and indeed this country. Protesters who felt their views weren't being heard have descended on the city, taking the fight to Adani's front door. Their resistance seems to be paying off, with a recent decision by the Queensland government not to support financial handouts to the mining conglomerate. As the battle between coal and coral reaches fever pitch on land, in the waters of the Great Barrier Reef, the unthinkable happens. In 2016, the waters across the globe warm to such an extent that it triggers a massive bleaching event, killing off huge areas of coral. Before the reef has time to recover, the next year sees another bleaching event, leaving further devastation. The low point for me, um, clearly in terms of the Great Barrier Reef, was 2016 and 2017, when we saw immense destruction of the Great Barrier Reef due to back-to-back -back heat waves uh, linked to, to global warming. That caught the science community and the management community by surprise. I think we all thought we had more time. Um, uh, it's the first time we've seen back-to-back -back bleaching, um, but 2016 was uh, a terrible tragedy. Um, the two events in combination have killed half of the corals on the Great Barrier Reef, um, and that means the Great Barrier Reef will never look the same again in the future because it's an absolute certainty that we'll see more of these bleaching events, not in decades, but in years to come. Professor Terry Hughes tweeted, I showed the results of aerial surveys of bleaching on the Great Barrier Reef to my students, and then we wept. Clearly the government's brief 2015 plan is failing. You might think it's funny, Senator Order. O'Sullivan, but the Order. rest of Queensland doesn't. Why? To your question. Professor Terry Hughes also said, it is not too late to save the reef if Thank we you, leave Senator coal Wish -Wilson. in the ground. Time for asking the question do you agree? Minister. Mr. President, do, do, do I agree that Senator Wish Wilson needs a hanky? Well, I think Senator Wish Wilson needs a lot more than a hanky, Mr. President. <laughs> Senator Wish Wilson needs a reality check on a whole range of fronts, Mr. President. I think it was very, very difficult for someone like Terry Hughes, Professor Terry Hughes, um, because he conducted two aerial surveys, one in 2016 and another in 2017. And particularly the one in 2016 took everybody 
by surprise at the sheer extent of it. I think he must have been personally devastated. And that was mocked and ridiculed in Canberra, which is just outrageous. Oh, just um, uh, devastating. But, you know, the, the feelings of the scientists are not the important thing. It's, um, it's the loss of the integrity of the Great Bear Reef and other reefs around the world because 2015-16 was a global bleaching event, the third one we've seen since 1998. So the people we should be concerned about are not the scientists. It's the people who depend on coral reefs for their livelihoods, for their food security. And those are generally very poor people in small island nations dotted around the tropics. In April 2018, the Australian government suddenly announced close to half a billion dollars to help protect the reef. However, this money is granted to one very small foundation with links to banks and the mining sector, who are apparently unaware they are being considered. Questions are quickly raised as to why the government chose this foundation. The website says it started with a small group of businessmen. I've heard that it's four. Nobody seems to know their names. It says rather than just talking about it, they took action and followed through on their idea. And thanks to that little idea, the Great Barrier Reef Foundation was created. I'd like to know who these, these you know, generous, big-hearted, well, environmentally-minded businessmen I, I, are. I'm sure that we can, uh, uh, on notice, uh, ask the Foundation for further evidence of their long <laughs> and deep and rich history, as Dr Reichel has, uh, has alluded and to. And their origins. We are. Can you um, confirm that the following companies are represented on the Chairman's panel for the Foundation? Peabody Coal, Origin Energy, BHP, AGL, Shell, ConocoPhillips and Rio Tinto? The chairman's panel that you're talking about does bring together CEOs from across the country, the largest organizations in, in the country, absolutely. What's the biggest threat to the Great Barrier Reef at the moment? The no. largest threat to the reef is climate change. Largest threat to climate change. And yet on the foundation, uh, on the uh, chairman's panel and the foundation, you've got the CEOs of the biggest polluters in Australia. I, I'm, I'm surprised the Labor Party and the Greens are so critical oh, of a that's record a great investment in the Great Minister. Barrier Reef. But, uh, so I'm no, what, I'm, what, I am, what I'm surprised about, Minister, is your cavalier yeah. attitude to the oh. granting of $444 million yeah. of taxpayer money without a public grant process, an open and transparent yes. process, a competitive process, a consideration of whether the authority could have carried out this work rather than a foundation, a foundation that has six full-time members and five part-time members that has described this grant as like winning the lotto. Surely you would agree that the commitment to have half a billion dollars of taxpayer money should not be like winning the lotto for the grant recipients. They should have prior knowledge, they should be invited to compete for that funding, and it should be done in a transparent way. What we've learned today is that the government made a decision to give this foundation the money before they'd approached the board to discuss it. Alan's journey has given him a great insight into the causes behind the poor health of the Great Barrier Reef. While the outlook for the reef is dire, there is still hope, but only if immediate action is taken. From just ordinary people, I see a growing desire for this to be uh, resolved and balance found from the politicians, not so much, <laughs> presently. At this point, I can say that um, there is no much sort of cooperation happening from the private sector. I guess uh, it's still possible, provided, uh, you know, we see all the uh, disaster being in progress. So maybe people will find eventually the way to coordinate the efforts to save the reef. If we cannot find the solution, the reef will definitely die within, say, 30, 40 years.